Come on, get out of there. Soldiers have tumbled out of bed in McKee Barracks on Dublin's North Circular Road since the British built it as Marlborough Barracks in 1888. Like almost all the 40 or so barracks scattered through Ireland from Donegal in the north to Spike in the south, McKee is a relic of old indecency, part of the trappings of colonialism, splendid in its day, but now too big, too old and too cold. In a sense, the new army of the new Irish state was lucky 50 years ago to inherit a ready-made military apparatus. Some of the esprit de corps and expertise of the departing British might well have been inherited by the new army. But practically no new billets have been built since then to replace these bleak dormitories with their turf fires and clattering staircases, apart from a 120-bedroomed luxury hostel for officer cadets attending university in Galway. <laughs> Almost 12,000 breakfasts a day, and that includes the 650 who joined up in the past year in response to the big advertising campaign presenting the army as a man's life and well paid too. <laughs> more expensive vehicles, equipment and weapons. A considerably bigger army and a new northern dimension to its role. All of these have pushed the cost of the army up to 49 million pounds this year. Steady on. <laughs> Hearty Irish stew keeps the cold out, but can hardly have dispelled in the past the occasional feeling among the men that the army had an element of unreality about it. It, for example, never fought a war. It is defensive in title and has no admitted enemies. Britain was our traditional enemy, but is hardly an anticipated adversary. Theoretical war games and contingency plans were all very well, if only the HQ staff of the day knew whom they were supposed to be fighting. After a day's practice on the range, there is another day's hard work cleaning and polishing. It's boring and monotonous, and perhaps fairly typical of how many saw life in the Irish army during many years of its existence. Frequently in the public mind, the army meant little more than the Aga Khan Cup at the horse show and a few pathetic naval ships. But peacekeeping for the United Nations in the Congo, Cyprus and the Middle East changed all that. Morale improved and with a higher profile came increased money. No longer did defence, that mysterious and almost unmentionable word, mean the Cinderella of government departments. Since Ireland is not in NATO, the army has no commitments to the defence of Europe. Although there may be a tenuous assumption that should the Republic be attacked from outside the island, we would not be left to fight alone. Autumn 1969 saw a new situation. Violence in Belfast and Derry saw field hospitals speed to the border to aid refugees. Army units moved to the border, but they did not cross it. Many in the army expected action, but the order of the day was simply to stand by. Queen. Hey, 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 
parade hey, ground hey, drill for hey, new recruits hey, at the Curra hey. camp. These lads may soon see service on the border. Exactly what plans headquarters staff in Park Gate Street have for them is an operational secret. Equally unknown is what the Army thinks of an opinion expressed privately last September by Dr. Cruz O'Brien, but later published, to the effect that in what has come to be known as a doomsday situation, the Army would not be capable of holding even one town in Northern Ireland. That allegation may now have receded, unanswered, into the middle distance of time. The response, however, to Napoleon's dictum that an army marches on its stomach would seem to be an emphatic yes. Although it helps to be well paid as well as well fed. Presumably on the advice of its advertising agents, the emphasis in the army's recent recruiting campaign has not been on intangibles like patriotism, but on the notion of a steady job and a steady pay packet. What made me join it? Uh, they worked in a factory for a long time, you know. And uh, I saw no future in it, you know. So I joined the army. What do you are the attractions of being a soldier? Security. Security. I think it's fascinating uh, to deal with, to be with men and to deal with them and to lead them. And uh, to get a return for them when, when, they, when they get a square deal. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm already man. I'm 40 pounds a week taken home. And uh, how old are you? I'm 33. Mm -hmm. The ratio of officers to men in the army is about 8 to 1. This doesn't mean, however, that a private has one chance in eight of becoming an officer. Well, like, if I want to push myself on, I can. I go for an NCO's cause or anything like that, like, you know. Uh, my next rank is uh, BQMS, which is Barrack Quartermaster Sergeant, mm -hmm. or Battalion Quartermaster Sergeant. Mm -hmm. What chance have you of being commissioned? Uh, Chances are much better now than they used to be. Uh, in fact, there's a course coming up very soon, and mm -hmm. those picked by their commanding officers. Uh, well, for you, is it, is it one in ten, or is it one in fifty, or what? I Roughly. don't know. I can't mm -hmm. say. Commanding officers recommend NCOs for uh, commissioned ranks. Well, they do, uh, let's say if the officers have been commissioned in the past year, how many would have come from the ranks? There was no potential officers course from the NCOs ranks during the year. <laughs> nor indeed in the past five years. With 20 commissions promised from the ranks in the next year or so, that means an average of about three men per year may hope to be commissioned from a strength of 10,000 men. The odds may be marginally better in the Air Corps, where 800 men defend our skies. The Air Corps is an integral part of the army and not, as in many countries, a separate air force. For a long time, the Air Corps and the Naval Service have been the poor relations of the Army. Public disquiet about our poor air-sea rescue capacity hastened the provision of helicopters over the past ten years. Now we have eight of these Alouettes. Last year, they were directly responsible for saving 14 lives. They carry out mercy and ambulance missions, as well as frequent air-sea rescues. Larger long-range helicopters could serve a useful function in fishery patrol work, at present carried out solely by the four ships of the Naval Service. But most of the training involving helicopters is like this. These alouettes can carry small groups of men into difficult ground situations. This exercise could well serve to rustle out an IRA group known to be in a localised area. Training of this kind has an obvious use in the kind of counter-subversive role envisaged for modern armies by tacticians like Brigadier Kitson. And, of course, could potentially be used to contain an insurgent civil population. Meanwhile, for the very first time, Recruits on their first day in the naval service faced the breezy rigours of Harbolin base in Cork Harbour. A little square bashing to begin with, they could find their sea legs later. Their motives for joining up were predictable and honest. 
I gather you've just started your training. Is it what you expected? It is, yeah, most, yeah. What made you join the Irish Navy, the Naval Service? Well, uh, it was a good job, eh? Steady. And uh, most jobs, oh, people being laid off at the moment, but there's not much chance of being laid off. Why do you want to be an Irish sailor? Well, it's for employment, for employment only. Had you lost your job? Yes. What were you at? I was laid off, I was a machinist. You were a machinist? So you thought the army was nice and secure? Yeah, secure uh -huh. job. What about uh, fighting for your country, if it came to that? Well, not, re not really interested, as far as military side is concerned. You're not interested in the military side of it? No, only the employment side. Today, the Naval Service has three minesweepers and an Irish-built patrol vessel, with another to come. It's a far cry from the days of the gallant Murakhu. Range increasing all the time. 4.6 cables astern. Bearing? Bearing. One. <laughs> Pipe gun screw close up. Divers trained to carry out underwater inspections, just one of the many functions of the Naval Service. Its principal job is to protect our coastal fisheries. Naval ships are by law entitled to chase a foreign trawler caught within our limits right back to its own territorial waters. That is, if the traditional shot across the bows or kick up the transom hasn't already stopped them. It's all part of our defense forces.